Welcome to Uptown Rumble, heavy music in the Bronx. My name is Stephen Payne, director of the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is April 15th, 2024, tax day. Uh, and here for an oral history with two members of Divine Infamy. Uh, the first, as far as we know, black metal band from the Bronx. Um, so excited to hear their history today. And uh, Vinny, why don't you introduce yourself and then Genghis, you can introduce yourself. Name, position, um, you held in Divine Infamy. Okay. So my name is uh, Vincent. I used to go by the name of Satanic Vinny in high school. Uh, eventually changed it to Lord Draconova for a stage name. And uh, in Divine Infamy, I was guitarist. Great. Thank you, Vinny. All right. Well, my name is Genghis. That's my legal name. I never needed a stage name. I was named after Genghis Khan. And I play guitars for Divine Infamy. Awesome. An honor to have you both here. And, um, and yeah. Looking forward to hearing all about Divine Infamy and what led you up to that. But before we get into music, why don't um, both of you start off by talking about your family history and background and um, how your family ended up in New York. Uh, um, Genghis, you want to go first? Yeah, sure, sure. Well, um, I'm from a Dominican background. Both of my parents were Dominican. They came here in the late 70s. So uh, they lived ever since 1976 in Inwood, New York, uh -huh. which is borderline Bronx. Absolutely. So the last stop of the 12. And um, yeah, they lived here for a long time. I was hatched, 1980, and here we are. Do you know, um, did they ever share much with you, like the circumstances that led them to move to New York or any of that history? Yeah, no, they moved here uh, to search for a better life. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. Uh, all my family is ex-military. They fought in the 1965 revolution. Ah, I so see. So they thrown the chip, um, te um, what you call it, the dictator of yeah, Trujillo. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, 1965, yeah, yeah, right. they fought in the revolution. So they wanted to come here and make a better life. I see, I see, I see. And um, where did they move in in Inwood? Um, what what uh, what like cross street? Um, well, we're on uh, Academy. Okay. Academy between Cooper and Seaman. Okay, and you you've been there ever since then. Huh? Forty four years. Wow. Both of my parents passed away, so I'm I'm the last of the Mohicans. Wow, wow. And what about brothers or sisters? Um, no, my mother had three miscarriages before me. I see. I and see. I have a half brother. Or we don't talk. I see, I see, I see. So, yeah, I'm the, I'm the only one. You're the only only, the only one. one. The descendants. Yes, that's right, that's right. Um, and what was the neighborhood like? What are some of your earliest memories? My earliest memories, well, before um, the, the Latin American crowd moved in, it was all Irish-German neighborhood. Uh -huh. That's why you have, we had a lot of Irish bars, like the Liffey, Irish Eyes. Most of the streets were named after Irishmen, like Cooper, Seaman, Broadway. So you had a lot of uh, Irish people there. But then, you know, the Dominicans and the Puerto Ricans started coming in, and it, it became Dominican land. Absolutely. Yeah, Still so is to this day. To this day. That's, <laughs> That's right. right. That's right. Um, and what kind of uh, apartment building did, did, I guess, do you live in? Cause you no, it's, in a, it's a rent-stabilized building. It okay. still has the fallout shelter, okay. nuclear yeah, 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 blast yeah, yeah. sign on the, on the outside. I think my building was made, like, in the 1900s. Okay. Yeah, so, sure. yeah, I'm still there. Still there. Um, and uh, what were some of your neighbors like that you remember growing up? Well, um, some of them are still alive. They were they were really good. They were like, it was back in our day when our parents were allowed to hit their kids. Yeah, yeah. Mom and dad weren't home. The neighbors would whip your ass too. <laughs> That's right. So, you know, you get out of hand. You start doing the wrong things. Neighbors come downstairs and give you that pow pow. Uh -huh. And then you go back to your Saturday morning cartoons or your Nintendo or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so it was a stricter... Um, upbringing but that's what made us the men that we are today sure we're respectful and we and we've been through a lot as a city as a state and we're still here fighting yeah. strong man yeah that's right mm -hmm. um and what kinds of music do you remember hearing in your house or on the street when you were a child well my mom used to be a dance instructor in dominican republic oh, wow. so she was into the latin dances yeah, yeah i have no rhythm yeah sure so the fact that i started listening to heavy metal you know where that goes with my family. They were looking for exorcists. Nobody wanted to add me on Facebook. They thought I was possessed. But um, my mom listened to a lot of Latin American stuff. But my dad was into like the Hendrix and the Van Halen. Uh -huh. And the sound of the electric guitar I was always attracted to. And all the video games I played, like Ninja Gate and Castlevania, had keyboards and guitars That's in right. it. So I was programmed since I was little to love this sound. Yeah. But until my father passed away is when I really picked up a guitar. And, you know, well, I believe that our parents look out after us after they pass away. All my rehearsals, all my band auditions happened in Music Unlimited. 
which is by Calvary Hospital, which was his final resting place. Wow. So he had me close. Wow. And this guy has always been my older brother. So all my music adventures have been with him. And he's like like my guitar hero. Yeah. I mean, I love Eddie, Eddie Van Halen and James Hetfield and all those guys. But this guy, I wouldn't have been the musician that I was if it wasn't for Vinny. Wow. Well, I'm going to ask you more in a, in a second about how you first met Vinny and, and all of that, yeah, that, yeah. that history. But before we get into that, um, why don't you talk a little bit about your elementary school experience, where you went, how it was like. Oh, man. Well, I went to PS98. I was, uh, I didn't really start growing until I was like 21. So I was like a little scrawny kid, you yeah. know, playing Nintendo at home. I remember I had braces. I was always picked on. Sure. So my mom put me in martial arts so I could learn how to defend myself. But it was rough because um, my neighborhood cleaned up now. Now they had to have the Starbucks and, you know, the nice white people moved back yep. in. Yep. But back then, it's kill or be killed. Yeah. If you weren't home when the street light went on, you, you would be in trouble. Yeah, sure. So I remember it was rough. You had the guys in the corner selling drugs. Which they still do. Sure. I grew up with most of these guys. Sure. But it was it was pretty rough. Yeah. Now things have calmed down. And now that I'm a little older, I don't want any trouble. Yeah. I was a bouncer for 10 years in some of the rough, roughest clubs here in New York City. I know how to defend myself, but that's the last resort. Sure. I only use that like if Vinny's ever in trouble, my family, my girlfriend, then yeah, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw down. Yeah. But for now, we're just good. Verbal resolution. Sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and... What what was like the student body and the teachers like at the elementary school? They were they were really good and they were really strict. Yeah, I remember having a lot of Jewish teachers, and they were survivors of like the Holocaust and concentration camps. Sure, because most of them had those number tattoos. Oh yeah, yeah. But yeah. they were really good teachers. They really cared about the students. They really cared about you learning. Yeah. So I had some really really good teachers. Yeah, I had really good teachers, cool. and we had the after school programs, and they made sure that you weren't part of the the trouble kids. I so see, even though, like, in the, in the in the courtyard, you, you saw the selling of drugs and all of that, they made sure that you weren't part of that. I see, I see. So they were they were really good. Now, I don't know what, what happened to the educational system. Yeah. Because I haven't been to school in a very long time. Yeah, sure. But back then, it was different. Things yeah. were different, man. And, and the most most simplest things is what made us happy. Yeah. We didn't even have technology. We would go outside, listen to music. I would come over, like, either Vinny's house or one of my friend's houses later on, yeah, just sure. listening to an album. I remember the first time I tried marijuana, listening to that Rush album, movie pictures. <laughs> oh, Pictures man. were moving. I was yes, like, I bet. <laughs> you remember the Matzo tapes? I don't know how old you are. The, the, the commercials, the guy uh -huh. on the couch, uh -huh. that was me. <laughs> so, yeah, man, it was it was good. It was a good upbringing. I don't, yeah. I don't have any complaints. Um, and then what about uh, junior high or inter intermediate school? Where'd junior high, intermediate. I was still here in New York, but for high school. My grandmother got sick, so I went to the Dominican Republic because oh, okay. she wanted me to learn the language, learn yeah. how to read it, and, and um, you know write it properly. Yeah, sure. So I spent four years in the Dominican Republic. Wow, that was rough. Yeah, because I was too Dominican for the Americans, uh -huh. too American for the Dominicans. Yep. So I was El Gringo over there. Yep. So yeah, it was pretty rough, and you know our next door neighbor is Haiti. Yeah. So the, I thought things were violent here. It was a different ball game over there. Yeah. So I'm glad I made it out alive. Where in the DR? Were um, Santo Domingo. Capital. Oh, okay, okay, that's where. But you're in the hood time. of Santo Domingo. Yeah. Because you see, when you go visit Dominican Republic, you're in a nice resort. Sure. sure Everything sure. is good, gated community. Mm -hmm. When you live over there, different ball game. Absolutely. Blackouts, violence. You're in the wrong place at the wrong time. You're dead. Yeah. Yeah. So wow. Yeah, so man. So in 1998, years. I came back. I see. To New York City, and then um, I went to college briefly. Okay, but um, I went to Borough Manhattan Community College. Yeah, and unfortunately, the towers hit 9/11. That campus was closed down, and um, September 28th of that same year, my father passed away. Wow! So I dropped out. Wow! So yeah, that 2001 was a horrible <sighs> year for everyone. Yeah, but it's the nicest New Yorkers have been. Yeah, for those two moms, <laughs> everybody's giving each other hugs. I love you, brother. They're holding the door, mm -hmm. and then we we went back to our regular <laughs> schedule program. <laughs> New York, you can't replicate the energy over here. Wow, wow. I've tried moving out. It's like the mafia. It keeps pulling me yeah, back in. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so true. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as far as, um, you know, growing up goes, why don't you talk some about, like, foods that you remember either, you know, your parents cooking or, or eating? Well, um, you know, raising a Dominican household, um, you know, a lot of rice, beans, meat. Sure. And it was what, what people call organic now. Yeah. That's the type of stuff we ate. Because I remember the cheapest thing you could get at a deli back in our day was avocado toast. 
aguacate uh-huh. with bread. Mm-hmm. Now, now it's like it's you like buy it at Starbucks for $9. Bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, what yeah, the fuck? Yeah. It's not even real avocado. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, so it's it was insane. more organic. You know, you had the plantains and salad. Because your parents made sure that you ate right because they put you in activities. Yep. So, you know, they made sure that you had good nutrition so you don't get sick. I never got sick in my parents' house. Sure. But then, you know, as I grew older, you know, your parents passed away. You got nobody to cook for you. So now you're at the mercy of these foods. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Um, and you mentioned that uh, you, you know, were always interested in the sound of guitar from your father's listening yeah. to music and the video games. Um, at what point did you, like, you know, start really getting into listening to music in dominican republic believe it or not latin america has the most hardcore metalheads in the world absolutely i remember somebody um i i knew what metal sounded like but i never heard growls my boy invited me over to the house we had a couple drinks he played a suffocation album oh i think it was pierced from within 1995 and i was like what is that yeah i love that shit yeah and ever since then i got hooked on that on that sound and it. then I started picking up acoustic guitar because I never had an electric. Yeah. So I had the classical Spanish guitar at home and I was trying to fiddle around. And all my friends have been musicians. But yeah, man, I fell in love with the sound of the electric guitar. But I didn't really start getting good until I started joining bands. I see. And my first my first band that I joined was Bloodcore back in the early 2000s. Okay. Because there was a, a club in Brooklyn called the Lemores. Yeah, sure, sure, I, sure. I was a bouncer there. But uh-huh. all our big bands like Biohazard, Judas Priest, Nevermore, all those bands played there. Uh-huh. And what's cool about being in a, a band in that local scene is you get to open up for your heroes for your band. Sure. So at the Blood Corps, I met all these heroes in the Bronx. Because uh, was... their, their, their legend status reached all the way over there at Benson Hurts. Uh-huh. Like, who the fuck is Evo Vinny? Who's Dennis? <laughs> Dennis, the bass player, he plays an astral cadence now. If you're watching this, Dennis, I love you, bro. That dude is like the whore of metal. He (laughs) has played played in every band you could think of. And he's still going strong because that dude joins three, four bands at a time. Okay. Yo, Dennis, what are you doing? Nah, man, I'm touring with this band. I'm recording with this band. I'm like, don't your fingers get tired? He's a bass player. I feel sorry for that dude's girlfriend. (laughs) That G string is done. (laughs) Yeah, man. Wow. Okay. So what... uh... How'd you first get involved with the, the guys that were in um, that first band you were in? In Bloodcore, um, all right, this is going to be embarrassing, but um, I stayed a virgin, so I was like 22. Sure. But for some reason, I was always attracted to Russian women. Okay. So uh, my dad always had this joke. He's like, son, your first experience, you got to take out the communist countries first. Russian, Chinese, and Cuban. My first three girlfriends, Russian, Chinese, and wow. Cuban. So, I, you know, to get the Russian girls, you had to go to Brooklyn. Sure. I got involved in that scene, chasing after the Russian chicks. Then they introduced me to the club scene. So, yeah, I, I pretty much started bands just so I could get laid. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to figure other G-strings. <laughs> um, Thank you, Russia. And... <laughs> Uh, I guess before you joined that band, what was the first, you know, I guess live music that you heard as far as, um, you know, a concert or... or well, um, you know, since they were local, they were from the Bensonhurst area. Yeah. Every weekend we would go to a show. Yeah. So I heard Biohazard live. Um, I heard Judas Priest live. Uh-huh. I heard, um, I think um, Nevermore went there a couple times. Yeah. yeah. So all these bands that, that you would listen to on albums, you get to see them perform live. Uh-huh. So now when I met up with these dudes, the Russian brothers that wanted to start a band, yeah. they were all listening to Testament and Cradle of Filth and all these bands. So I was like, yo, man, can I be in your band? They started me off as a bass player, and then I moved my way up to guitar. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, because I, I noticed that the bass player wasn't getting laid. Yeah. So I was like, then I, we gotta, we're going to get into the crossover <laughs> immediately. <laughs> um. So I'll ask you some more questions in in a little bit but but let's get Vinny up to you know more or less the same kind of stage of development in his life um so Vinny why don't you start off by talking about your family history and background and how your family ended up in the Bronx so I'm primarily Italian um some German as well probably a quarter as far as I know my great-grandparents came here from Italy and Germany okay for the reason um I believe, at, I believe at the time there was uh, some issue going on with uh, food 
And that's I probably see. why they came over more than likely. I see. Um, but the grandparents were born in the Bronx. Um, they had two daughters, my aunt and my mom. Uh, they were born, uh, I forgot where she was born, but she did live over on Burke Avenue, my mom. Okay, okay, down okay. Down by the train station, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Um, after that, she met my biological father. I believe my grandfather was into uh, hunting or fishing or something. Yeah. And that's how he met my father. And then, strangely enough, his friend ended up marrying his daughter. <laughs> which I'm like, ah, okay. So they, they uh, got married when she was young. Yeah. Probably, I think, 17, no, not 17, like 18, 17. Yeah. I'm not 100% sure. And then she had me when she was 23 or 24, I think. I see, I see, I, was I see. born in 1975. She was born in 1949. I'm not too sure of the math right off the top of my head. Yeah. But um, stood together until I was eight. Okay. And then he left. A week later, my stepfather moved in. And I'm like, ah. I'm like, huh? So I don't know what was going on there, but clearly there was a, a break in the relationship between the two of them. They didn't, you know, get along very well. Yeah. And they probably, from what I can tell, knew and they were okay with someone dating someone else or what have you. Sure. But then he came in and he's been my father since I was eight. So the other one I never seen ever again. Yeah. So then, you know, my stepfather became my actual father. Sure. Um, he died in January, I think, of last year or the year before. Wow. Um, but I was on, I, I grew up over on Bronxwood Avenue and uh, are now by Allerton Avenue. Uh-huh. Yeah. And what kind of building was it that you grew uh, up in? A private house. Yeah. Uh, built approximately 1910. Uh, wow. They say it was a one-story building at the time. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the artwork, it sort of looks like a one-story. Uh, stood there until 2003. Okay. Briefly moved to Throgsneck with uh, someone who, whom I was dating at the time. Yeah. Didn't work out. Came back to the neighborhood, lived across the street from my mom for like 12, 15 years, and then uh, up and left to Connecticut in 2018, Stanford, yeah. where I'm currently sleeping and storing my goods. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not a big fan, uh, but I do hopefully plan to move back yeah. at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit about your earliest memories in the neighborhood? Earliest memories my neighborhood. Um, I would go out, play with some of the local kids, cause trouble, um, breaking a lot of the... Yeah, so uh, memories of growing up, I would uh, hang out with some of the local kids and get into trouble. I remember down the block there was uh, this rubber tree that this old man was like nurturing. I'm going up there with a fake lightsaber and I'm hitting it so I can see the <laughs> The milk come out of it. I'm like, oh, bang, bang. <laughs> He's chasing all of us away, you know. Yeah. But then eventually a lot of them moved out. And uh, at some point I became one of the only kids on the block. There was like maybe two or three other children on the block. Hung out with them a little bit, but we didn't really get along too well. So most of the time I was uh, in my house playing, yeah. playing with like toys and whatnot myself. Sure. So, yeah. Sure. All right, Vinny, so um, why don't you talk a little bit about your elementary school experience, where you went, how it was like for you. Elementary school. So I went to PS76, which is across the street from where I used to live. Uh huh. And I went there from kindergarten to third grade. Uh, it was pretty cool. Um, again, I wasn't really hanging out with too many kids. Yeah. But, you know, we, we did hang out and play in the school. After school, yeah, sure. I was too young to really hang out with Sure, them, sure, so. sure. But, um, yeah, I was hanging out a lot with... Uh, my first girlfriend at the time. Oh, wow. Her name was Sonia. Yeah. A little uh, Italian girl. But I was always hanging out with her, and then eventually, you know, that stuff, you know, peters out. Yeah, and whatnot. sure. Um, got into trouble in the school, so they ended up uh, sending me to a different school in Co-op City. Oh, okay, okay, um, okay, I see. I went to 178 at that time. Uh, it's by Truman High School. Okay, yeah, 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 sure. So in the fall... Of '83, I ended up going down to that school. Stood there until '83 to '85-ish. Yeah. Then I went to uh, junior high school. 
180, IS 180, uh -huh. and I was there from 85 to 88. That okay. Was the junior high school period. And I met a lot of the people who uh, I actually know now. I actually know two people from back then, not a lot, but I know two people still from back then. So uh, my friend John, who's been in the bands with me, the keyboard player. Yeah. Um, I met him in 1983, and I still talk to him to this wow, day. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, um, I was two years old. <laughs> and uh, this other guy named Johnny, he was in a band called Goddamn Hate. Oh, uh, okay, I met okay, him okay. in junior high school. I see. So like sixth grade. Wow. That area. Stood there. Um, got into trouble in yeah. both schools. Yeah. My mom was always in the school. Constantly in the school. <laughs> you know, for like dumb shit. Like I, I was infamous for doing, and no one's going to be surprised to hear this. I was infamous for doing really stupid, stupid things like... Uh, <laughs> I had come back from suspension once, but then a friend of mine and I were like, he was like, oh, look at these matches. I was like, oh, that's cool. So we're sitting in the back of the classroom, and he's lighting matches by this book. I've heard these stories, but go ahead. Yeah. So we got in trouble, but I, I don't I don't know what the uh, rule is, but because of some technicality, you couldn't be suspended when you came back from the suspension <laughs> on the day of, of you coming back. So we got into like a lot of trouble. Oh, my Stood God. Stood in the uh, principal's office, I think, for like a week or two. Yeah. Um, my mom got a call for that one. Um, then a week after that, oh God, a week after I stopped getting in trouble, I ended up having a fight in junior high school with a girl who knew martial arts. Oh no. Oh, oh man. Right. So we were, I was like really egging her on. I was calling her all sorts of names you shouldn't call a woman. Yeah. And then yeah. when I hit the C word, oh, oh I've man. never seen a girl or anyone Put, she put her hand up on the table, she got up, and she somehow managed to throw her body like that, and she connected with her left foot to my neck. And it was oh like, bop, and I was on the ground. I bet. Oh, my um, God. She then looks like she hopped over the table, got on top of me, like, adjusted her, like, knees to here and here. I couldn't move, and she's like, bop, bop, bop. And I'm like, holy shit. I eventually managed to throw her off, and I remember running into the... Um, running into the, uh, running to chase her down the hallway, and the, uh, dean came out and to prevent me from touching her, he ended up clotheslining me. Oh, this big guy! God. Like, he was like, boom! My mom came, she, uh, looked at me and she was like, I'm gonna fucking tell you something in a few minutes. <laughs> oh, man. She went to go talk to, like, the, uh, dean, the principal and whatnot, and while I was in the room, this was, this was stupid on the school, they had her and me. Sitting in the room looking at each other, two feet away from each other. Wow. Right. Don't use the C word in America, bro. That's cute in London. I know, I know right? In London, it's great, right? So, uh, the school cafeteria was across the uh, hallway. I ran in, got a knife, ran back into the room, was going like this, and my mom threw herself in front of the girl. And she's like, you better fucking kill me, because I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and I was like, I took the knife, and I was like, I put it down on the table behind her, and I sat down nice and quiet. <laughs> so uh, that got me suspended again. Um, after I sort of calmed down, because then it was high school, Yeah, got into like one fight, I think, in high school. Yeah. Probably one. And it was the stupidest fight ever. Um, it was Christopher Columbus, right? Yeah, I think Christopher that's right. Columbus. 1989 to 1993. That's where I ended up meeting Manny. Uh, a lot of other people. Who uh, I met, I only know now from the local scene at that point. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, and uh, I remember I was eating lunch with these two guys. And we're talking about our history of fights. Mm. I told this one guy about the fight. I no, I didn't tell him. No, no. He said, "Man, he's like, let me tell you. He's like, my sister had a fight with some motherfucker in uh, 180, and he called her a cunt. If I ever met this dude, I'd beat the shit out of him." And I'm like. <laughs> He's like triple my size, a big burly, like freaking like thug guy, and I'm like, oh yeah, you you need to find him, <laughs> fuck him up. <laughs> I was like, I'm not gonna hang out with him no more. <laughs> so I purposely him. went whoop every time I seen him in the hallway. <laughs> I was like, I'm not stupid. Wow. But wow. I finished up high school with no major issues. Um, sure. Oh, I know. It was one issue, and uh, this does not represent who I am now at all. Um, it was me and a whole bunch of kids doing the Pledge of Allegiance. And for some reason, we decided to go hail Hitler in the middle of the uh, thing. It was me, this African-American kid, this Spanish kid. We were all a bunch of assholes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, 
Another guy named Vinny Serrano. You know, Vinny and Vinny is a bad combination. Yeah. Two Vinny's. We do it, and the Jewish principal walks in at that moment. Oh, oh my God. And he's like, you, 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 and you, come with me. I was like, shit, I was like, what a Vinny guy. He called my mom. I did not get suspended, but I sure as hell got my ear talked off and yelled at. And the whole damn night, I got written up for it. But, um, never did it again. <laughs> Um, he was like, you know, what the hell, why'd you do that? I was like, oh, I like to push buttons, which I, I still do to this day. <laughs> you know, but uh, no, I, I never did anything that stupid. <laughs> like Jewish people don't play around. Yep, yep. My girlfriend's yep. Jewish. Yeah, and, well, not to mention it's completely wrong. Yeah, now no, I know when I'm older. We do all manner of stupid things as <laughs> Absolutely, kids. absolutely. After that, I just went off to college. Um, John Jay, for about a year, um, decided to change my major from... Um, forensic psych to general psych, and I finished up at Lehman. Okay, okay. Stood there for uh, the four years. And then I graduated, did absolutely nothing with the degree that I got, and that's it. That's, <laughs> and then my uh, education history for now. Sure, sure. Um, so, why don't you talk some about, before we get into music, um, food that you remember eating growing up? A lot of Italian food. Yeah, yeah. An awful lot. Pasta. You know, baked ziti, uh -huh, lasagna, uh -huh. the the whole nine. Yeah. Tons of pasta from my mom. And my grandmother would cook a lot of, like, veal. I see. Did your grandma live in the neighborhood? She moved to New Jersey probably in the 70s. Okay, okay, okay. I, I see. Yes. With my aunt. She also moved out to Jersey. So there's a lot of uh, veal and whatnot at her house. Also pasta as well. Yeah, sure. But I remember her dish, her dish being specifically veal. It was... Very good, actually. Yeah. I didn't have to miss having it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, um, besides that, pizza. Yeah, sure. Know, the neighborhood. Sure. That White Castle was down the block. Yep, that White is. Castle. They're still, still there, yeah. So, you know. Yeah. Um, and what about music that you remember in your household? Your mom listening to or wow. music in the neighborhood? My first live concert was actually in utero. Whoa. And I had the honor of being in the same building as Elvis. Oh, wow. <laughs> My mom said that he came up to her while she was pregnant, and he sang, I believe, My Way. Oh, okay. And he okay, touched her stomach. <laughs> wow. So I was already, like, christened by, by, by the gods. And I was like, I was probably in there going, mm. <laughs> um, So that could have sparked something, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Uh, but besides that, listening to the music that my mom was into, she was into a lot of rock and roll. Okay, sure. 50s rock. Sure. My uh, stepdad also was in a lot of uh, into a lot of like, you know, rock and roll as well. Um, Elvis, tons of Elvis. Yeah. Um. Uh, what do you call? Them? I forget the name of the group, but a lot of those bubblegum pop bands. Sure. Which I'm, I don't quite like too much now, yeah. but I do like some of them. Yeah. And some of them are bands of substance. I'm on like the Doors. Yeah, sure. Alice Cooper. Okay. Um, my stepfather liked a lot of country western. Yeah. I, I like country western, but it's got to be older. Yeah, sure, like, sure, sure. Um, you know, Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what about, like, you know, around the neighborhood or, you know, say, like, uh, in intermediate school before? Ah, that was rap. Okay, yeah, Lots sure, of sure, rap, sure. which at, at one time I, I didn't like it at that point. Yeah. You know, it was yeah. unavoidable. Yeah, sure. I mean, I didn't start, like, you know, uh, looking like this or dressing like this until I probably... 88. Okay. I 89, see. 89. Somewhere see. in that area. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, it was unavoidable. I mean, the Bronx, you know, you're going to have hip hop and rap. That's right. And to be honest with you, to this day, that's the only rap that I like is the 80s type stuff. Yeah. In the yeah, early yeah. 90s. A lot After of After that, stuff I'm there. like. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, and do you remember the first, like, cassette tape or, or album you bought? I remember the first time I was exposed to a cassette in an album. Yeah. It was at my mother's best man's house, and they were hanging out downstairs with the family. And I was always in, like, his kids' bedrooms, messing around, looking to see what they had. And I seen um, the, uh, the uh, older kid. He was probably 16 at the time, and I was, like, 11, 12, maybe. And uh, I seen he had uh, LP of Iron Maiden Live After Death. Ah, uh, okay. And I was okay, like, okay, okay. Yeah. I was like, that's really cool because I've always been into like fantasy even from a young age. Sure. Highly into it. So uh, I saw that picture and I was like, that evoked images of fantasy. I'm like, that's awesome. And I read the lyrics and I'm like, yeah. oh, these are all like lyrics of mysticism and whatnot. I'm like, I 
like that because I'm very much into that. Yeah. I put it on and I was just like, I heard the guitars. I was blown away by the guitar work on these guys. Uh huh. Especially the twin harmonies that they do. I was just in awe. And then when Bruce Dickinson sang, I was just like, okay, this is great. Yeah, yeah. He also had Aerosmith. I listened to it for like five minutes. I was like, nah, like, I don't like it. Yeah, sure. Put it down. And then I see he had Metallica Kill Em All. Yeah. Put that on. And I was like, Oh, this is even. I was like, this is great. I was like, not as good as Iron Maiden because I didn't. I didn't like Metallica for quite a long time. I didn't like them until like maybe like eighty nine. Oh, uh, I, I didn't see, like see, James Hetfield's voice. Yeah, yeah. Um, looking back, it's good now. Yeah, and my sure. My favorite album from them is still Kill 'Em All. Yeah, but um, the lyrical content, I was like, it's cool. It's very aggressive, but I would like to have the mysticism mixed in with the heavy music. Yep, that would be a perfect like you know marriage. Yeah, sure. So. My first two albums, really, that I got into was uh, Iron Maiden, Live After Death, and Metallica, Kill Em All. Wow. Yeah. Um, and Vin Vinny, I want to ask you more along these lines in a second, but just to go back to Genghis for a second. You mentioned the Suffocation album. Um, what about other albums that you first got into, or, or if you remember the first well, like, album um, that you purchased? In Dominican Republic, I didn't really have albums. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, being a third world country, we were into that Mitch tape scene. Sure, absolutely. So I would have my friends like make me a compilation like tape like i would have like uh some of metallica's and justice for all yeah um i remember they were like into ramstein uh -huh. i would have like different things on the tape I but see, I see, the, I see. the whole album suffocation Pierce within we would listen to that just to piss off our parents yeah because yeah. all the growling and shit you know these guys are like catholic and they hear all the growling they're like what's going on in there <laughs> they come with the holy water and take us to church <laughs> and yeah man as i said when i started playing in bands especially divine infamy we did the whole you know face paint thing my family members wouldn't add me on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you got a girl growling, you got nail polish and fucking face paint. Yeah. And they're like, nah, we can't add you on Facebook, man. You got to go find Jesus. <laughs> so uh, my, my next door neighbor, which was a pastor, he still is a pastor. He's like, man, Nijo, I see you with the nail polish. Have you found Jesus? And I was like, Juan Pablo, come here. This is all an act. I'm just trying to get laid. <laughs> all right. Well, God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> we did it all for the nookie, brother. <laughs> yeah, so it was a whole bunch of mixed tapes. Sure. But I think the first album, full album that I bought was when we converted everything to CDs. Yeah. I think about the Black Album. Oh. 1991. Okay, okay sure. It. Yeah, about sure. the Black Album. Yeah. Because, you know, that's when Metallica kind of like toned down. That's right. And But there were some really, really good songs on yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I didn't really like Load or Reload, but yeah, the Black Album, anything before the Black Album was, was amazing. It was really good. Absolutely. Even though, you know, people say that Lars yeah. is a shitty drummer, but it doesn't matter, man. The music, you see these guys are in their 60s still jamming. Yep. So, yeah, man. Um, so, Vinny, uh, did you, as far as, um, you know, music that you were listening to, would you get, you know, albums mostly from friends, like, like Genghis with mixtapes and all? Or were, were, were there places around the Bronx where you'd go? So, uh, I would go to uh, record stores and look at the album covers, yes. predominantly, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. and the song titles. There was a, was a record store on Pelham Parkway. I forgot the name of it, but I used to go there. Oh, and, where on Pelham Parkway was it? Um, by Lydig Avenue. Oh, okay, 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 I see. It's the name of the record store. But um, I would go in there, and I would first I went in for the Iron Maiden albums. I asked them, I was like, what Iron Maiden do you, albums do you have? And I was like, could you order their back catalog for me? And he was like, okay. And I was like... <laughs> I was an only child, so I was sort of spoiled in that regard, you yeah. know, to get stuff. So I took, you know, advantage of that. Um, you know, so he would order, like, back catalogs, and he'd be like, oh, why don't you check out this band? He was, like, showing me, like, the names of the albums and whatnot. So it started to be, like, Iron Maiden. Second band I got into heavily was King Diamond, Merciful Fate. Oh, okay, okay, okay. By that sure. time, I was already uh, into the occult, actually. At yeah. that time, I was uh, 14. I mean... Definitely not how how I am now. I didn't know too much still, so I was sure. developing. Sure. Like anybody <clears throat> develops along their path. Um, but those titles, I was like, oh, man, I was like, Satan's Fall, like Black Funeral. I'm like, yes, this has to be, this is awesome. Then it became like Slayer eventually. And, yeah. You know, then I got into the, a lot of the thrash bands. Sure. Um, in high school, I got a lot of, a lot of into the thrash bands, too, because I met friends who were into, like, thrash and whatnot. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, records and stuff on uh, Westchester Square. Okay. Was another place that had a lot of uh, albums. I see. So uh, I would go there also in the early 90s to pick up albums. 
And that's why I bought my tickets for live performances, live shows. I used to have a ticket uh, ticket place there. Oh, okay, okay. So those were the two primary record uh, stores I would go to when I was um, my early teens, like 14, 15, and part of 16, maybe. Okay. And you you mentioned that you were already getting into the occult, like age 14 or so. Right. Uh, how did you first get into it? Was it mostly through the music, or were there other avenues, too? It was actually had nothing to do with music. Oh, okay. Let's see It actually had absolutely nothing to do with music. Um, it was actually a personal experience when I was in the single digits. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. I had an experience that I would classify as being occult-related, which a lot of people, of course, would say is bullshit. Yeah, sure. Um but uh, there was no explanation for it, no logical explanation. So I started thinking, I was like, all right, that's a little odd to have happened. Yeah. Um, I was like, let me uh, tell my mom about it. Yeah. So my mom, uh, you know, she didn't really like pay much mind to it. Um, not very religious at that time. Sure. Um, but she then explained, you know, her like ideology on it. Like, you know, maybe she, she thought of, what maybe happened. She said she had experiences in the house we grew up into, uh, mm. which was old enough to possibly have people, I mean, 1910. Yeah, sure. So, um, and I always remember, every time I was, like, younger, I would always gravitate toward fantasy. Uh-huh. Always the people who were the, quote, evil ones. Yeah, sure. Which, in reality, they were the anti-heroes. Yeah, not sure. Not necessarily evil. Sure. Evil is a completely different definition. Um, so, like, you know, Darth Vader. Uh-huh. Skeletor, yep, all that kind of stuff. But uh, eventually, uh, I remember I was in I was in the school bus. And I freaked out this old lady. She was talking about like religion and whatnot, and she was like, "Don't you want to go to heaven?" And I was eight years old. I was like, "No." <laughs> wow. You know, I had I had had catechism as a young child, but after yeah. that, there was no religion at all. Yeah, sure. In the house, it was just more like you know, be a good person, follow the law. Yep. Don't be an asshole. And that's pretty much how I was raised. Sure. So, no, uh, the music had zero influence on me. As a matter wow. of fact, I actually, uh, at the time, was looking at lyrics for the bands that were supposed to be satanic. And I'm like, this is fucking cheesy. Oh, I'm like, wow. this is not authentic. Wow. Uh, maybe one or two of them, I would say, at the time were. Yeah, sure. Uh, King Diamond, I believe, was. Yeah. Um, and maybe one or two other bands at the time that I was into, I would say were. Yeah. Just from, like, how they would word some of their songs. Sure. You know, the whole, like, crap that some of them spoke about. Even to this day, uh, I I can't take a lot of, like, the songs that talk about the occult. I'm like, ugh. I'm like, yeah. I'm not even into it. I'm like, you're misrepresenting it. Please don't do it. Yeah, sure. So. Sure. Yeah. What do you, what'd you think of, like, um, you know, some of the Slayer albums? As, as far as um, that way? I knew it was a gimmick. Yeah. Right? Yeah, 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 um, yeah. I was like, this is really gimmicky, but I like it. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. It pushed buttons. Yep. And a button pusher likes things that push buttons. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So that's I was right. like, ooh, hella weights. I, like, I love that, especially since my grandmother and my aunt were a little more on the religious side, the Catholic uh, side. I see, I see. So I'd I be see. wearing all the shirts to their house. <laughs> and they would talk so much shit that I could tell my mother, you know, you got to do something about Vincent. My yeah. mom's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, no problem. You know, she can do shit. Yeah, sure, sure, she sure. She was like, yeah, please. <laughs> So, um, so like what age were you when you started to like, you know, dress the part of uh metalhead and all of that, do you think? I started in 88. Okay. Okay. With so the band t-shirts. It was all Iron Maiden t-shirts. t-shirts. Okay. Sure. 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 Like, oh, Iron Maiden shirts. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. Maiden, 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 Maiden. Yeah. Um, high school, I got a little more, you know, my mom started giving me a little more shirts. Sure. Um, early in high school, uh. I, I started with the Maidens, Aussies, Aussie shirts and uh-huh. whatnot. Um, I think I had a Guns N' Roses shirt at the time. Yeah. But then, like, when I discovered, like, at that time it was death metal first. Okay, sure. And I was like, oh, an angel. I was like, David Vincent definitely is authentic with what he's talking about. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. I was like, and I like the band, and the t-shirts are awesome. So that immediately started, like, the death metal t-shirts. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, I kept all the other shirts because I still wore them. Yeah, sure. I still do have a lot of high school t-shirts to this day wow. that I still remarkably fit into and I wear. Wow, that's awesome. So, from there was like the death metal t-shirts, you know, a lot more like offensive things like sure. uh, Cannibal Corpse, Butchered by Birth. And I remember <laughs> this art, art class lady came up to me, she was like, that would be an excellent anti-abortion shirt. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> because the back of the shirt has the child skeleton and the front has the children being butchered. Yeah. Um, she's like, that's a very nice anti-abortion shirt. She's like, but it, it could offend people. I'm like, that's great. I'm like, it's a public that's school. That's the point. I'm like, it's a public school with no dress code. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So he immediately like, <laughs> I was outspoken. <laughs> and the fact that my mom would always advocate, advocate for me. Helps. Absolutely. That's a good she thing. She was always at the yeah. school for stuff. Not necessarily it was me getting in trouble. I didn't sure. get into much trouble in high school, like I said. Sure. But the teachers knew her. She made herself visible. Yeah. Wow. So. Um, and as f you, you mentioned you're still in touch with um, friends that you made even in, you know, intermediate school and all. Grammar school. Or yeah. In grammar school even. Were, were they all getting into, you know, metal as well? So uh, my uh, best friend, John Colonna. Yeah. Um, we lost contact in like 1980. Five. Yeah. And uh, I met, re met him in 1989 because he was in school too, Columbus. He lived on uh, Pullman Parkway, apparently. Um, we're in gym class and I'm sitting there. And I had an Aussie shirt on, black sweatpants, and just sitting there talking to this guy. All of a sudden, this guy walks up to me and I'm like, this guy looks oddly familiar. He's like, Minnie? And I'm like, John? <laughs> He's like, oh shit, you're not dead. And I'm like, He's like, oh, Mario said that you 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 did you you got it you got a drug overdose and died. Oh my now God. you know me. <laughs> this guy never does drugs. I've never drugs. smoked anything. I've never done any sort of drug in my life. And I I started cracking up. I'm like, of course Mario would say that. I'm like, <laughs> I've never even done a drug in my life. Yeah. And he was like, really? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, that's what you get for trusting him. <laughs> But when you do drugs around them, you get hired. <laughs> what <But> I remember, <laughs> it's, it's the evil, I don't the know what it effect. is. The fucking tattooed, but I'm like, I'm yeah. in the presence of greatness. <laughs> that's funny. Let's yeah. write an album. So that's, that's how I, that's how I re-met him was in high school. Yeah. Wow. Um, um, and we kept, up, we kept in touch ever since. He's been in a lot of the bands I've been in. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you met Manny in high school too, right? I met Manny in high school, 1989. He was enough. Actually, I met him on opening day, like freshman day when everyone goes Wow. Home. I remember it was me. My mom had walked me to school, um, which I have no problem admitting. You know, a lot yeah, of people sure. are like, oh, oh. But no. Um, she came. She met a lot of the people there. She met Scott Marshall that day. I know he's he's been mentioned. Uh -huh. Scott Marshall, I remember I was sitting there in the auditorium for, uh, what do you, what, I forgot what it's called, but we were all in there getting like a... Um, custom things telling us how things would I see you know work and I'm sitting there she my mom was like how old at the time 49 so she was like 39 at the time or 40 right? yeah she looked young then Manny Manny was probably here I think Scott Marshall was on that side and I hear Scott Marshall say so what classes you got you mind if I walk you to my mom <laughs> and then my mom goes what she's like my son next to me and he's like oh i'm sorry and i'm like oh dude hitting on your mom Jesus i'm like Christ. god i'm like he's not even oh wow oh my god my mom would kill me if i said that so yeah that's funny i was like come on so that's how we met scott marshall we met him. i met him on the first day of school wow what a way to meet yeah manny i had met him he had long hair at the time actually. yeah yeah um had a few classes together we started hanging out together in school. Yeah. At the time, we had a lot. Of, we had shop class together with this guy named Nick Ho. I believe he maybe mentioned. Yeah, him yeah, too. that's right, that's right. The guy did. got him into like a lot of the heavier uh -huh. bands because uh, Nick Ho had a large cassette collection. I had a sort of large cassette collection at the time. Um, not as much as I have now, obviously. Yeah. But um. Yeah, so Manny and I started talking. We had a lot in common. Um. At that time, I had not discovered black metal yet. Yeah. It was still death metal. Yeah. Um, I remember, uh, I don't know if he was present, but I remember I was walking up the, the stairs in Columbus High School. I had fake leather boots on, cowboy boots, right? Because uh -huh. uh, I didn't know what proper metal code was. I was like, oh, acid wash jeans, cowboy boots, and like an Aussie shirt. Yeah, yeah, With sure. a bandana tied around my knee, I looked like Punky Brewster. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> and I tripped on the way up the stairs, and the dean goes, no dancing on the stairs to look in front of everybody. <laughs> and everyone cracked up, my mom included. I'm like, great. 
I don't know if you've seen that, but it was it was hysterical. <laughs> so, well, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's how we saw how we met. We hung out a lot. Um, and from there, things just progressed, you know. And yeah, yeah, sure. Um, when did you, you know, start becoming interested in playing music? Playing music, I started in '89. Oh, okay, okay. So right around, right around the time where I sort of discovered it, like a year or so, maybe after. Okay. Um, I told my mom I wanted to play guitar. She was like, "Okay." So she bought me this silver guitar, uh, Stratocaster, um, imitation Stratocaster. Sure. And a PVM, small PVM. Okay. With a HM two pedal by Boss. Yeah. Which is very sought after now, apparently, for the sound that it gives. <laughs> uh, which I kept it. Um, played terrible. Yeah. It was awful. Um, and then I met some people in my neighborhood who were into metal. Yeah. I was actually fortunate in that there was a lot of metalheads in that part of the Bronx, even though it was like considered the, one of the quote, ghetto areas. In the yeah, Bronx. sure, it sure. It really wasn't. Sure. Um, I met, uh, I was walking home from high school actually, in 89, and I walked by, I walked by St. Lucie's Church, and I had my Aussie shirt on, and I heard this kid behind me go, he walked past me. Then he called my he called me from behind. He's like, he's like Ozzy, and I'm like, I turned back and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm like cool, thanks. And we started talking to each other. This guy named Tony Lunario. Uh huh. Uh, we became friends. We exchanged numbers. Um, he was actually in a band at the time. So my first real exposure to like music was through his band. Oh, what was his band called? Um, if you remember, Eternal Damnation. Eternal Damnation. Okay. okay. They were a thrash metal band. Okay. All right. So That's immediately I was like, yep, the music I like. These guys play thrash metal. We're going to get along just fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, he lived pretty close to me. He was on Laconia Avenue at the time. Okay. He later, later relocated to Paulding Avenue. Okay. Uh, I'd hang out with him in his uh, house with his mom. I remember she used to be there. Um, he actually started teaching me how to play guitar. Okay. Because I was like, oh, you mind teaching me? He's like, no, yeah. sure. He's like, I'll, I'll show you like whatever you need to, to learn. Yeah. So I uh, started hanging out with him. He started teaching me how to play. I met his friend, Nick Spaccarelli. Guitarist in his band also. Uh -huh. I don't think they had a drummer, but they had a bass player also named Anton Anthony Fari uh, Fariello. Okay, okay. And he lived up the block from me in a house that's no longer there. You know, so I would go hang out with him. Yeah. Hang out with Nick. Hang out with Tony. They eventually um, got into more of like the, uh, I'm not going to call it glam rock because it's not glam rock technically. It's sure. hair metal. Sure. Glam rock is more like David Bowie and New York yeah. Dolls. It's a completely right. different genre. That's right. People confuse the two. Yeah. Um, they then got into uh, that type of music. I see. Hair metal. And um, they called themselves in the beginning a leg show. Oh, okay. They named okay. themselves, I believe, after a porno magazine at the time. <laughs> oh, God. So I was like, leg show. And then they brought on this other fellow named Steve yeah. to play with them and, uh, for a while. They'd had no singer. And then they met Chris Hendon. I think his name came up. Oh, yes. He was in Manny's yes. band. That's right. That's HR. right. That's right. Um, they changed their name eventually to Red Viana. Okay. Um, and I've always kind of liked the uh, hair metal because of the musicianship. Yeah, sure. And sure. Uh, some of the so-called hair metal bands, in my opinion, weren't really hair metal. Like Wasp wasn't really hair metal. They were yeah. like shock rock. Yeah, sure. And I really loved that look that Blackie Lola had. I was like, that's fucking cool. Like, the makeup and the blood and the hair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was my first real exposure to music. Ah, okay. After that, I decided, hey, let me get my own band together. And that's when Digression was born. Digression, and, and Manny was in that, too, Manny right? was in that. Jay was the drummer. Uh -huh. Scott was the singer. I was the guitarist. And uh, eventually, we wanted a second guitarist. I believe Tito came in as a guitar player. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Uh, um, eventually, that band didn't uh, work out. Everybody uh, sort of like wanted to go their own way. Yeah, sure. You know, they got more into like hardcore uh -huh. at That's the time. Right. And at that moment, I was discovering black metal. That was like in 93 uh, is when I discovered it. See. Early, early 93, the winter of 93. So like, you know, like 92 actually. Even. So you were, what, maybe a senior in high school? Were you still in high uh, school? I was probably you... a uh, sophomore. Oh, okay. Because of my day. Oh. Because of the way I was I born, see, I, my, see, I, see, I, see, I see, graduated I see. a quote year later. Cause my, I see. How I was born. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. In that March. makes sense. I see. That's what I. So they were like, all right, you know, they want to do hardcore. I was like, yeah. okay. I was like, fine. I was like, you know, everyone has their own direction that they need to go their own path in life. You can't force people to join the same path because it doesn't work. Sure. That's how you start getting resentment. In life That's right. By forcing others to do what you want and not what they want. So I was like, all right, cool. I was like, yeah, no problem. So Digression broke up. They 
formed Driven by Hatred. Uh huh. And uh, I formed my first black metal band. And what was that called? Crossbearer. Crossbearer, okay. Crossbearer. Um, it was weird. It was proto black metal. It wasn't even black metal. I see. We were into so much other stuff. Yeah. My keyboard player, John, was heavily into techno and electronica. Okay. He still is to this day. Wow. Um, the bass player I had met through my friend Adam. Yeah. Uh, I met this guy named Adam at a Red Viana show. Yeah. Um, he heard me like talking about metal and whatnot. So we ended up actually meeting one day, like when he was waiting for school. Yeah. Uh, waiting to go to school. He was in uh, Spelman, so he took the bus. Uh, and I uh, had been walking with a girlfriend of mine, walking her to school. Uh, and I was like, oh, shit, never meet people. Okay. So, you know, we exchanged numbers. He was a drummer at the time. He was interested in drums. Yeah. And I was like, all right, you know, cool. I was like, come in as the drummer. Got my friend John here as a keyboard player. So we started playing together. Uh, it was really weird. Like I said, it was had black metal influences, but sure. had other influences too, like White Zombie. Yeah. So sure. it had this weird grooviness to it, yeah. which black metal didn't have at the time. Yeah. Um, eventually, he put down the drums because it was impractical for him to play in his house. Ah, I see. I and see. I don't think he had the drive to continue learning the drums. Sure. Maybe got discouraged or whatnot. Became the vocalist. We met this guy named Brendan at the time. Uh, he came on board. I met him through some other friends, high school friends. And I met these other two guys who were really into black metal before I knew what it was. Huh. This guy named Ray and this guy named uh, Mac. And they were, uh, I knew Adam. I think Mac went to Spellman with Adam. Oh, and Mac okay. was friends with Ray. Yeah. So that's when we all started met. So Ray immediately, when we started talking, he was like, check out this band, Burzum. And I was uh. like, that shit's fucking good. I was like, this sounds very raw, yeah. primal. Yeah. Evil, wicked. I was like, I like the sound, even though you know his vocals not that great at the time. Yeah, but I thought it was great. Yeah, you know, I had to really like Venom. Yeah, I was a big fan of Venom already, which is first wave of black metal. Sure, proto black metal, Celtic Frost. I was a fan of. Yeah, um, a lot of like those heavier bands. I was really into Bathory. Sure, I thought they were great. Sure, I was gonna ask you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what about like um some of the stuff coming out of Brazil uh um, before. Like, the sound really became heavily, heavily uh, I liked Sepultura a lot yeah. in their first two albums. Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. That was their more death metal That's right. period. Yeah. Um, I liked Arise. Other was good, but then they started going the route of, like, hardcore. Yeah, sure. Which, despite liking some of it, it wasn't me. I see. Yeah, I feel yeah, like yeah. the person needs to stick with their personality with music. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I, I, I didn't mind it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's a crossbearer. Sure. Eventually morphed into this band called Vrykolakis, which was much more black metal. Oh, uh, how do you spell that? Just uh, for V R Y K O L A K A S. I believe it's Greek. Oh, okay. It okay. Vampire. Oh, okay. I didn't name it. The yeah. bass player named it. Okay, okay, I see. At the time. And uh, we played a few shows together. Um, eventually that sort of like died out, and that's when I decided to form this other band. I was like, Brendan, what, what, what name do you have in mind? He's like, how about Divine Infamy? Uh, I mean, obviously, there were other people I played with in the band. That the people were going in and out like crazy. Yeah, sure. So, but eventually we came to Divine Infamy. Well, and what year was that where Divine, the, the seeds of Divine Infamy first 1994. Oh, okay, okay, wow. 93, so 93, 94. Late 93, early 94. I see, wow. Okay. Um, now... Before we get more into that, why don't you talk a little bit about um, how you first discovered, you know, black metal? I mean, obviously, the first you're familiar with some of the first wave stuff already, like Merciful Fate and all. Yeah. But, but what was the first album that you heard? Was it Burzum? First one was probably Burzum. Oh, okay, it was Burzum. Okay, okay. probably Burzum through the yeah. through Ray. At I the see. Time. Um, I got him into this uh, new band also named Marilyn Manson. So, uh -huh, uh -huh. I, I was like, oh, this guy looks fucking cool. Yeah, yeah. So I got him into that, and he got me into, like, that. So I see. So I after see. after Burzum, it was Emperor. Oh, okay, okay. Because Adam had gotten up a compilation at a show. Oh, I see. He's seen, he's seen in, he may have seen Enslaved when they were very, very new. Yeah. And he came home with it. He was like, check this out. And I'm like, I'm like, keyboard? <laughs> yes. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and were you still like listening a lot to death metal and other kinds of I was listening to a lot time? of death metal still. Yeah. Um, never really the gore stuff. Yeah, sure, it sure, sure. Silly. Yeah. More um, like the occultish kind of. More of the occult type stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, Morbid Angel for sure. Sure, sure. I know Deicide was just doing it for like a, maybe a look a lot of the time, but I, I liked them. Yeah, sure. Like, yeah, this is cool. People didn't like his vocals on the first album, but yeah. it was very black metal as well. Yeah, 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 sure. I liked it. I thought it was great. Um, yeah. Besides that, it was still Iron Maiden at the time. Yeah. It was, but they've always been in there. I see. Iron I Maiden's see. always been in there. Yeah. And, uh, King Diamond for sure. It's always, they've never like left. Yeah. So, um, and aside from, uh, you know, meet, meeting, meeting Elvis <laughs> in, uh, when you were still, uh, you know, connected to your mom, um, what was the first um, concert or show that you went to yeah. after you got into metal? So that was uh, New Titans on the Block, I believe. Oh, that was 1989. Okay. September 8th, 1989. Wow. Um, it was uh, Exodus, Suicidal Tendencies, and this new band called Pantera. <laughs> mm. And that show was extremely good. It was at the Ritz. It was at the Studio Ritz. 54. That's right. That's right. And it was an extremely good show. Yeah. It was a pit of hell down there. I bet. I didn't really mosh much. I was like, nope. Yeah, I was going to ask if you went into the nah, pit. rarely. <laughs> Occasionally yeah. I would, but yeah. very rarely. You have to really get me psyched up to do it. Yeah, sure. And I wouldn't go just in the pit like this. Uh, well, <laughs> I'd be dressed right. down so much. <laughs> Most right. of us have battle scars from the yes. mosh pit. As you can see, my knuckles have no skin on them. Oh, yes, Because yes, I was yes. a bouncer. Uh -huh. And then after work, I would go to the shows. And then I would play with bands. So that's all the denim and the leather and uh -huh. the spikes and the zippers. Uh -huh. So yeah. you see, it's hard to get a, a job when you when you put your hands down. Yes. And, and, you know, this pit bull has history. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Well, besides Divine Infamy and that other band, I was in a lot of other bands. Yeah, well, sure. I, so many. Like, well, you're a legend in the Bronx, right? After, what? After uh, Degression... Final Revelation was a band I, I, I found it with some kids up in Pelham. Okay, what what they sound like? Proto Thrash. Okay, okay. Um, drummer is very, 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 very good, and the guitarist as well. Yeah. The drummer is now a uh, touring member of uh, the Tokens. Oh, they sing that uh, in the jungle. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. He's a touring member with them. He's played. He's he's toured his entire life uh, with uh, Broadway performances. Wow. Doing musicals and whatnot. Wow. He's an accomplished jazz drummer. Wow. The guitarist is an accomplished jazz guitar player. I remember the first cover uh, song I ever did was uh, Shot in the Dark. Huh. Ozzy Osbourne. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And then we upped it a little bit. We, we played the uh, Lima High School Battle of the Bands. 1991. 1991, yeah. We're yeah, playing yeah. Hangar 18. Wow. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. That's a guitar hero. That was wow. an extremely difficult song to learn. Wow. I didn't do the leads. He did all the leads. Yeah, but sure, they sure. were still That's difficult. Insane. Wow. So after that, I uh, got into my first death metal band. That was called Avul uh, Avulsion. Avulsion. Okay. Yeah, um, that was with uh, Rick, Rick, the drummer, and some other guys we met at Lehman. Yeah. Lehman. Mike and Mike. Yeah. Two guys. Yeah. <laughs> the Mike mics. and Mike. <laughs> Mike Square. <laughs> and then after that, it was... Uh, you know, then it was like the black metal stuff. Um, yeah. Divine Infamy. Um, I did a, a, a brief stint in Driven by Hatred. Oh. Probably a week or two. Okay. Nothing big. I see. Yeah. So. I see. Um, so aside from the Lehman Battle of the Band show, um, what other places were you playing during this time with the different Train bands? Depot. Train Depot. Train Depot we played when it was there. Um, Which band was that with or bands? Train Depot was uh, Rikolakis. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Train Depot was Rikolakis. Um, we played with Rikolakis in, uh, I forgot the name of the place, but it's in Mount Vernon. Oh, the, low, the Lowdown? The Lowdown. Yeah. I have pictures from that still. Oh, wow, wow. Um, we played the Lowdown. Yeah. We played Spiral. Oh yeah, the, yep, the spiral. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That might have. Yeah, that was Rikolakis. Still, we opened up for this uh, black metal band named Apisagoroth. Oh wow! Which they're still around. Mm. We opened for them. Um, what else? We played? we played a backyard show. Oh, in Pelham, uh, in Pelham. No, in Scarsdale. In Scarsdale. Oh. No one complained miraculously. Wow. Did you that ever play is the nest? 
Like, Remember there was a nest uh, in Bronxwood. It was like somebody's like uh, garage. So. A lot of the newer bands played there, like oh. uh, behind the walls of silence and um, wow, you know, like misery. I know I've hung out there. Yeah, yeah. I know they I've played hung a lot of there. shows there. That's in Bronxwood. Yeah. Oh, huh, huh. Yeah. And so it was like somebody's garage in somebody's house. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they had a lot of local that. metal shows. Wow. There. Played wow. other places, we know we've got a divine infamy. Because yeah, I'm the newer generation, yeah. these guys yeah. older than me. Sure, sure, sure. So That's I right. came in into bands like when I was in my late twenties. That's right. So I was a new kid on the block. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Why don't you talk about some of the places you played before Di- Divine Infamy? We'll get into Divine Infamy in a second. Well, the but... thing is, all my metal history has been involved with Vinny. Uh huh. Uh-huh. So I, even when I didn't know him, yeah, I heard his name because um, right up the block we played in this band called Evil Inn. Oh, she, yeah. Her house was here in Bainbridge. Oh, really? Oh. So it was my first experience oh, wow. playing with a keyboardist. Wow. Because, you know, when you play guitars with a keyboardist, you got to know your sheet music. You yes. got to know your notes. Very That's accomplished right. keyboardist. Yeah, very back. accomplished keyboardist. Wow. So evidently, if you're watching this. Um, yeah, so we a lot of people used to jam at her house. Okay. So yeah. most of the guys that you interviewed here, I probably met at Evelyn's house. Wow. Geo from Demise uh-huh, uh-huh. used to play there. Wow. Uh, Wolf was in Demise briefly. He played there. So we all used to jam there, but um, all my musical influences, like the stuff that I would listen to, yeah, I would ask people like, "What did you hear this band like, Cradle of Filth, like the uh-huh. black metal stuff?" And they would always reference Vinny. Oh, wow. Vinny showed me this album. Vincent wow. showed me this album. You remember Peter? Yeah. He used to live on Lydig. Yeah. We um, Peter is this guy I used to hang out with. We used to do martial arts together. He mentioned Vinny a couple times. Oh, I grew up around this guy named Vinny, and he had guitars over his house. All this evil music, it was great. And then I finally meet Vinny. And I was like, what the fuck does Vinny look like? <laughs> All right? Because I keep hearing this name. Yeah. And they're like, bro, he looks like Anton LaVey. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. So when I met him at Evelyn's house, I'm like, you must be Vincent. We clicked. We, we spoke for a little bit. But we never got to jam at Evelyn's house. Yeah, sure. But we would bump into each other at local local shows. Because yeah. we know the same people. Johnny Diaz from Goddamn uh-huh. 8. As I mentioned, Gio from Demise. So um, later on, um, I used to hang out with Gio at Music Unlimited because, um, you know, G- Johnny used to jam for Goddamn Hate. Um, Gio told me, oh, I have a band called Demise. Come and check us out. Yeah. So at the time, after Blood Corps, I wasn't playing in any bands yeah. until I got to the bronze scene. So one thing led to another. And Gio, if you're listening, thank you for the opportunity. Anything I learned about, you know, touring in bands and playing shows, I played in Demise briefly. Oh, you were in Demise briefly. Okay. And then uh, Vinny tried out for Demise. Yeah. So that's yeah. where our, our little bromance started. Yeah. Uh-huh. So he hired the both of us. And then from there, Vinny and I had this chemistry. I was like, I don't want to play with anybody else. Yeah, yeah. So we, uh, he played in, in Demise briefly. I stayed a couple months after he left. But then I started getting sick. I wrote Gio an email. And I believe he found somebody else to play. Because Gio's been around in the scene he has for been. a very long he time. He has yeah. been. That dude's a legend in his own right. You interviewed him here. I met Lewis because he used to be in Gordomentis. Yeah, sure, sure. And our, the room that Demise had, we share a room with Billy Club Sandwich uh-huh. and Gordomentis. Uh, so all those okay. dudes that you interviewed, yep. I met them. Yep, yep, yep. Um, but then uh, later on, I wasn't active musically. So Vinny and I, you know, we still bumped into each other in shows. Sure. And he said, listen, um, my band Divine Infamy, we're getting back together. Why don't you come to So Bro Studios and try out? Uh, so Bro Studios was a shithole on 138th where, where Street. Was it? Oh, 138. 138th Street. It was right in the middle the of nowhere. How, yeah, how, how long was it around for? I, we probably jammed there for like a year. Oh, okay, okay, okay. A year. Because there weren't any available spaces. Because I remember Rich had lost Music Unlimited. Yep, yep. And you either had to go to Astoria Soundworks mm-hmm. or you had to go somewhere in the city. Yeah, sure. And, you know, $30 an hour. Nobody was on that budget. Yeah, so that's So a Bro... Lot. For 60 bucks, we'll be there for three hours. Ah. So um, I tried out for Divine Infamy. That's where I met Brendan. We had a vocalist at the time named Kit. Uh-huh. I yeah. met I met John Colonna. Uh-huh. We had a bass player called Jonathan. He was in a hardcore band. Okay. And I tried yeah. out. And Vinny was telling me, oh, you're in. But those assholes made me wait three weeks before, you know, they're like, oh, yeah. you're in. Because, you know, Brendan, all of them had to yeah. improve. Yeah, sure. But then we had uh, we had good chemistry. We wrote good music. And I have nothing bad to say about Brendan. Yeah. Actually, the job that I still hold today was because of Brendan and our security company. Wow. And uh, he, at the time when things were rough, that we didn't have a music studio to jam in, 
we would jam in his parents' basement. Oh, wow. And I remember this this guy, Brendan, like, not to kiss his ass or anything, one of the best drummers that I've jammed with. Yeah. He's like a combination of, of Adrian from At The Gates uh -huh. and Daniel from Arch Enemy. Wow. Because he was into, like, the Swedish death metal I and see. black metal. So his double bass sounded like a helicopter. Wow. One day we were yeah. jamming at his house. Somebody's china fell from the wall. I remember. <laughs> And and one of the samples he had was from the Exorcist. You're gonna suck cops in hell. I His Irish mom goes, to Brendan, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> Shut that shite off. I yeah, remember. it was great. <laughs> we couldn't jam at his house no more. So uh, we started jamming in Astoria Soundworks. Kid had left and um, we were looking for a vocalist. Yeah. I didn't know how these guys felt about female vocals. Sure. Because at the time I was into like Arch Enemy, like female vocals. Uh -huh. First time I saw Arch Enemy live was at Lamar's. Yeah. I heard the growling and I thought it was a dude. Yeah. When I came out, I was like, all oh, that evil is coming from a woman. I'm in love. Uh huh. Yeah, man. So yeah, we did all that. And um, as I said before, I knew Shauna for a very long time. Yeah. Because I used to be a bouncer in Astoria. Uh, She's from Astoria originally. Yeah, yeah. And I used to jam with my friends at Astoria Soundworks. So I had asked her, as I listen, I'm in this little thing called Divine Infamy. Why don't you come and meet the guys? Yeah. And um, she was half Norwegian, half black. Yeah. So she was into a Montemar. She was into a bunch of those things. And when these guys heard her growl, they're like, nah, she's fucking in. Wow. And we had great chemistry. We even recorded a three song demo. Things were going great, and um, as a person, she was like my little sister, man. Yeah, sure. You know, she was one of my best friends, and, um, you know, I, I still love and care about her, even though we don't keep in touch, because unfortunately what happened to her. Yeah. But we're going to, we have to put that behind us. Yeah, yeah. sure, sure, I've sure. had the same number for 18 years, I've lived in the same address for 44 years, and I've had the same email. Yeah. Brendan and Shauna need to get in touch with me, they know where to find me. Yeah, sure, so sure, I said sure. before, I'm grateful that Brendan gave me the job that I have today. And everything he did to contribute to the band. Yeah. Because that dude put some of his own money for oh, us yeah. to record our three song demo. Wow. He almost got in trouble with his parents because we used to rehearse in, in the basement. Yeah. Sometimes in his apartment, he would play with the electronic I drums to oh. write music. And his landlord was giving him shit. Wow. So we got the music together in part because of him. Wow. And financially stable, the only two guys that were financially stable was him and Vinny. Uh -huh. And they were putting some of their own money into the project. So those dudes really made it happen. We played um, a few live shows, and then unfortunately, what happened with Shauna? Yeah, we had to stop, and we were hoping that you know she was going to be in there briefly because yeah. we were waiting for her to come out. But we knew that it wasn't going to happen. Yeah. I mean, I was hurt because, as I said before, best friend and everything. Um, we had this guy named Andrew yeah. try out for the band. He was a very big fan of the band. Yeah. So we tried to continue without her, but it was just it was just too painful. Yeah. It was never the same. It was never the same. Like because you know. We were trying to start that movement with the female vocalists. That's right. And now, 2024, all of our favorite bands are female vocal. Yep. So we could have we could have made it big. And you you all were one of the first. So yeah, we were one of the first. Um, what year was it when Divine Infamy you know reformed in this way? 2009. 2000. Okay. 10, nine or ten. Okay. Nine or ten. Nine or ten. I had just broken up with someone, and I needed something to get my mind off of the breakup. Yeah, I see. I see. And I, I see. Like, Let me get the band back together. I That's see. That's when I contacted Brendan and everybody else, and yeah. Oh, and where where were where were the other um, members of Divine Infamy from? I mean, obviously, Shauna, you mentioned. No, but... um, Brendan is from Bedford Park. Okay, okay, He's okay. from I Bedford see. Park. He lived there for many years. Wow. Okay. Shauna was from Astoria, Queens. Uh -huh. Manny, which later on he came, he came to check out the band because yeah. he wasn't really yeah. into black metal. Yeah, sure, sure. But sure. he loved the WWE, like the face That's right. and all That's of that. Right. So he came in, and he looked like a tough guy. And I was like, yeah, who the fuck is this dude? <laughs> you know, because I was sizing him up. Because me being a bouncer, yeah, I got intimidated because he was all big and husky. I'm like, yeah. if I say something out of line, this guy's going to fuck me up. Yeah, yeah, sure. So then he's like, no, no, that's my best friend, Manny. It's fine. He's cool. <laughs> he plays in hardcore bands, but he's not that angry. Yeah. So whatever. Um, And then we met. We started talking. I've never shared a birthday with anyone. Yeah. He told me his birthday is August 14th, just like mine. Wow. Romance. Wow. Yeah, I love this dude. Wow. He was he was like older brother as well. And I'm going to tell you a quick story about when we recorded our three song demo. Yeah, sure. That's what we had to tell you about the legend of Vinny. Uh huh. He always had the flying V guitar. Uh -huh. His guitar followed him everywhere. <laughs> and Still you know how they have the pick of destiny? Yeah. That was the guitar of destiny. <laughs> the guitar of so destiny. So when we recorded our three song demo, I was nervous. 
for some reason, um, my Ibanez wasn't yeah. working with the connector. Yeah. Because we were tuned to D standard. Okay, sure. So, you know, Vinny wouldn't let anyone touch that guitar. Yeah. So the fact that he said, bro, record the demo with this. And I said, Vin Vinny's one of my guitar heroes. So I had all of them around me because I think I recorded my parts last. Yeah. And it's like the band was cheering me on. And I was like, I made it. I don't care if we play live. I don't care if we get signed. That was. I'm it. jamming with my friends. This That's is amazing. Awesome. It's good sounding. That yeah, was, that wow. three song demo was good. As a matter of fact, great. Vinny just put it up on SoundCloud. Yeah. And just hearing it for the first time a couple of days ago, I got nostalgic because we were like a family. Breaking up with a band hurts more than breaking up with a girlfriend. Yeah, 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 These yeah. are people you live with. Yep. You travel with. You sleep over each other's houses, and you create music together. You fight. You argue. And just the fact that that you know is no longer exists, yep. it hurts. Yeah, for sure. And I wish I could still keep in touch with all these dudes. Yeah. You know, Geo for demise, Brendan, Shauna. But we all went separate ways in life. Yeah. As I said before, you gave us the opportunity here to record this and our side of the story. Anybody needs to reach us. We're the same dudes. That's right. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> We're the same guys. Anyone right? can get in hold of us. Yeah. It's relatively simple. As far as the demo goes, we'll we'll do a little backtracking in a second and, and fill in some more of the history. But um, where did you record the demo? What What's the title of the demo? Was a demo no, title? It was Divine. Just Divine. 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 Okay, okay. It was so an EP. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I think we recorded it somewhere upstate. Somewhere upstate. I forgot the guy's name. Manny's. It was Manny's uh, contact. Yeah, in front of Manny's. I wonder if it's the guy was. that that recorded our raid and some of the other bands too. Probably because JC. I think his name was JC. JC, JC that was it. Wow, yeah, so y'all yeah. recorded there too, huh? Yeah. yeah, in his house. It was really cool in his basement and he had great sound. He knew what he was doing. He was very professional. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he made sure, because he did everything step by step, we had the scratch track uh -huh. and he made sure that all our parts we were happy with so he was yes. a really, really cool guy. Man. Wow. wow. And, he, and it was his first experience with black metal. Yeah. So he was like a kid at a candy store. Yeah. He's like, what, you got keyboards? You got oh, females yeah. growling? All right, Vinny, so um, we're going to backtrack a little bit and bring us up to the point of you know where we're at at Divine Infamy. Um, but as far as some of your first black metal bands went um, and your stage presence, would you all... Uh, you know, put on corpse paint the whole kind of thing, or you hadn't got there yet? First band, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, Vrykalakis, we did. I see. And that was more of the traditional black and white. Okay, um, sure. So we, we definitely did it. For yeah. For certain, we did it. Um, Divine Infamy, we did also. Um, it was, the corpse paint was... It was Manny's idea because he was Man, the, he loves the it, wrestling, right? And I he, see. To this day, he loves it. Yeah, um, yeah. So he wanted to do it. I so wanted to do it. Yeah. I, I did it like once in a while. Yeah. But I was frankly too lazy to do it. Yeah, sure. It's a lot of work. It is. I was <laughs> like, look, I'm like, I got, I got the clothes. Yeah, yeah. It's good enough. You invested a lot of money in these outfits. Right. That's right. So yeah. like, I was like, the clothes are good enough because it's a lot of work, you know, the makeup then. I mean, technically, you could just go on with like crappy makeup, but yeah, if you sure. wanted to look. Good the whole time. You have to go with, you need base, you need this, you need sealer, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, no. Well, you always had the contacts in. The contacts have always had. you and had, Brendan right? never used the face paint because both, um, Brendan would use the zombie eyes. Yeah. And he would have contacts. You right. don't want that paint oh, going see. into your eye. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. He would do the contacts. I would do the contacts, bangs, all that yeah. good Me shit. and Manny did, did the face paint. I see. And Shauna, she had more of a, like, a goth look. She yes. never oh, had yeah. any face paint. But yeah. she was her own thing. Like, yeah, absolutely. This chick dressed like a like a R and B queen during the day. Yeah. And when she puts that golf thing on, we're like, "You, mommy, you're gonna beat us? All right, <laughs> fuck it." Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So my my look sort of came from multiple sources because I, I I like a lot of different styles of music. Yeah, sure. Heavy and not heavy at sure, the same time. Sure. So. A lot of the black metal stuff, yes, I have a lot of the black metal look, but I've also incorporated uh, elements of traditional 1980s goth, uh -huh, uh -huh. Cure, Susie and the Banshees, whatnot. Um, also, some industrials in there. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of industrial, like uh, specifically cyber industrial, cyber oh, goth, okay, okay, sure. that sort of thing, which I also like. Um, my two favorite genres being black metal and actual, like, Goth rock, like yeah. Sisters of Mercy, Fields of the Nephilim, and whatnot. Sure. My two top genres of all time. Um, so I just incorporated everything, and it became an amalgam. 
It was like, what's your style? And I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. Everyone's it's like, Vinny. that's Vinny. <laughs> yeah. Like Manny said, he's like, Vinny now. He's a character. <laughs> he said that. And I was like, yeah, he's right. <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, Genghis mentioned that he already had heard Legend of You in the scene when he started getting into it. Um, do you remember when did people, you know, start calling you like evil Vinny or Satanic, oh, Satanic Vinny. Vinny? That was in high school. That was in high school. Okay, that was strictly okay. ninth grade. Strictly ninth grade. I ninth, see. I see. Twelfth. I, I see. And maybe a little bit after that. So people who know me personally, yeah, will say Satanic Vinny or Vinny. I see. For a long time, yeah. people who know me a long time, like all my newer friends, it's like it's Vincent. It's right. Vincent. It's not. It's not a. Vinny or I Satanic Vinny. I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. That's how you know if people know me long. Uh, they I see. call me that. I see, I see. So, Vincent's more, more. Yeah, recent. more current. I see. Yeah. I see. Um, and as far as the first, I guess, version of Divine Infamy went. 1.0. 1.0. Um, how many of your own songs did you write? Um, you know, what was your first concert or your first show, if you remember? Mind if me, 1.0, actually, uh, of all the members, there were only two members who uh, were in 2.0. So Shauna was part of 2.0, Gang yeah, was sure. part of 2.0. Sure. 1.0 was me on guitar, this guy Joe on bass, uh -huh. Brendan on drums, John Colonna on keyboards, uh -huh. and uh, this guy Stefan on guitar. I see. Stefan, in my opinion, is a bit of a virtuoso. Okay. He was heavily into, like, power metal. Wow. Yeah. Man of War, um, Hammerfall. Sure. And you could hear it in his playing. Okay. Neoclassical. Yeah. I was like, wow, this guy is really good. Wow. Um, we played, the first big show we played was actually at the Blackthorn. Where we, oh, it was over just here. down the road. Yeah. Just yeah, down yeah, the road. Yeah. yeah. So we played there. That was Divine Infamy 1.0. We played, and I have pictures of that too. Go figure it Wow. Um, we played there. And that was Divine Infamy 1.0. Don't know if we played anywhere else. We might have played maybe one or two other places. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember who you played with on that Blackthorn show? Any of the other bands? No. I think okay. I, I did. No, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And do you remember around what year that was? That was two thousand. Oh, actually, it was the nineties. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was uh maybe ninety eight. Okay, ninety eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Possibly. I see. I see. Um, and did Divine Infamy 1.0, um, did you all ever do any recording or anything like that? We have a recording, actually. Okay, um, yeah. On cassette. Yeah. And I also have a, I have a player that can transform cassette to MP3 and whatnot. Uh -huh. So I actually converted it. So now it's actually on electronic wow. file. Wow. My iPod, actually. Wow. So uh, that's when John Colonna was actually the singer of that band. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. We didn't do keyboards, actually, at that point. He was the singer, and a damn good singer he was. Yeah. And the music was also much more black metal at that point. I see. That's because uh, I don't think Stefan was writing the music because he really didn't, he wasn't into the black metal. Yeah, the sure. He is now because I bumped into him. But I was more into the black metal, but the soloing was all him. Wow. Wow. So, so it was like black metal with um, really virtuoso guitar intricate. work. Intricate. Very intricate guitar work. Wow. Very hard to keep up with. Yeah. But uh, made me a better player. Yeah. I played with people who are very good musicians. You mentioned it. Evelyn. Yeah. She didn't talk in terms of like, oh, play this note, that note. She was like, A, C, E. And I was like, crap, I got to learn what that is. Yeah. That's so right, that's right. she really helped. Yeah. yeah and then thank after you. that, we started jamming um, with a lot of keyboard players like, like John Colonna. And um, yeah, it's good to, that she taught us how to read the notes on our fretboard. Yeah. Because Vinny and I have our own language. Yeah. Oh, yeah, just do a pinch harmonic here. There's yeah, an octave yeah. chord on the seventh fret, ah, I see. so we, we we know what tunings we're on. Sure, but you can't discuss our the keyboard. Our board. playing styles mesh. Yeah, yeah. Gangnam Style. I'll be playing one thing on one on one area, and he's playing something completely different elsewhere, and I'm like, wow. it actually goes together. That's cool. Wow. Yeah. Oh, he inspired me a lot, and even though like I was into the black metal stuff, but I was into the later stuff like Cradle of Filth, Amy Borgir. We both listen to evil music, but I listen to like the newer stuff. I see. So being inspired by him is that we blended the old and the new. Yeah, man. yeah. Uh -huh. And then he was like, that's all down picking? I'm like, yeah, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm one angry. of the best uh, downstroke guitarists I've ever met. Wow. Like playing super fast riffs, just downstroking. And I'm like, <laughs> I hard. cannot do that. Damn. I mean, I can't do that anymore. I have no yeah. damage on my right hand. Sure, sure. So um, hopefully 
Hopefully. Hopefully it'll get fixed. Maybe when Vinny has a, a new band, it'll it'll come back. That'd be awesome. Because I, I, I've been in four projects with Vinny so far. We played together in Demise. He asked me to join Divine Infamy. He had another project called The Illuminati. Okay. And yes. um, I think we got back together for Divine Infamy. We had like a reunion show oh. with Scott from Eden AD. In okay. 2014, right. we played The Black Door. Oh. We tried to like Queens. revive it. Queens, I see. We I tried see, to revive Divine Infamy, but as I said before, it was just too painful just to bring it back. Yeah. It wasn't know. the same. It wasn't the same. The vibe was off. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Because um, most people wanted to jam with us. Most people wanted Divine Infamy 2.0. Yep. Yeah. Which was the biggest incarnation. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the most successful. Yeah. yeah. Wow. But the people that would approach us, uh, they just wanted to be part of our project because of what happened with the girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that hung over our head for a very long time. Yep. And that's why we couldn't move on. Mm. Um, so with Divine Infamy 1.0, where did you all record, you know, like I said, was it just at a rehearsal? That or? was at a Music Unlimited. Oh, that was a Music Unlimited. Okay, okay, okay. I see. Yeah. I see. And... The songs from Divine Infamy 1.0, is there continuity between those songs and Divine Infamy 2.0? Some. I've okay. taken some parts from songs of Divine Infamy uh, 1.0 and moved them over to Divine Infamy 2.0. Okay, so okay. Some. I see. I see. And um, with, I guess, either or both versions of Divine Infamy, um, who's like the primary uh, composer of the music and the lyrics so in divine infamy uh 1.0 was john with the lyrics yeah and myself we would work together yeah um writing the rhythms it was me yeah leads with stefan sure 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 and divine infamy 2.0 uh lyrics were all shauna oh okay completely okay, okay. shauna wow and a lot of the writing the rhythms and whatnot yeah Genghis. ah okay. you can't give all the credit to me a lot of the rhythms were from you yeah i put parts in there Mm -hmm. You can hear like the parts that I put in because they sound more like traditional older yeah. black metal. But I Genghis see. is uh, riffing was very catchy because huh. he was very much into like the newer bands like yeah. Lamb of God and yeah, whatnot. Sure, sure, sure. So Divine Infamy, while heavily inspired by black metal, uh -huh. was not one hundred percent. I see a lot of different things. There was the play, a huh? mixture of the newer stuff yeah. and with the black metal, which I yeah. think was another thing that got people. Mm. They liked it. Which is what you hear now in 2024. That's we right. were doing that back. That's back right. That wow. Um, as far as like the keyboards, they brought another element to it. That's um, right. We, had a, we have a song, um, Forsaken, Queen and Forsaken Time. I forget yeah. what it's called off the top of my head. But John Colonna was doing the keyboard and it was a synth. And it sounds like Rush. <laughs> so I'm like, I was listening to it the other day. I was like, that sounds like Rush. Yeah. Like a lot. Yeah. So well, he was inspired by the, the Castlevania video games. Yes, very much very the video symphonic. games. Wow. And John Colonna was good. But all the riffing, I can't take all the credit for because the thing is, Vinny brought the project back to life. He brought the band back together. Yeah. Um, I remember when we lost Kit and the bass, uh, the vocalist and the yeah. bass player, Jonathan, we had uncertainty in the band because we only had like three songs. These guys didn't want to continue. Yeah. So um, I wanted to make Vinny proud and start writing some stuff just to inspire the other guys to stay. Sure. So I would be at home and riffing all oh, you know, Vinny, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? And next thing you know, we wrote all these songs, and we're like, nah, this is this, this is good. Yeah. We're going to make some good stuff out of this. Yeah. Because the more songs you write, and you have two kick-ass guitarists communicating back and forth, you have that chemistry, you won't, you would want to stay in the band. Yeah. Yeah, and we were doing, we knew that we were in the presence of greatness, that we were doing something new and different. Different. Because yeah. as I said before, 2024, that's what you're listening to now, female fronted vocals. Yeah. Keyboards, uh -huh. heavy like thrash riffs, black metal riffs, different influences. That's right. Yeah. So who knows yeah. if we if we would have uh, still been together? Who knows what we would have yeah. done? I know. I know. Wow. But such is life. Wow. So with Divine Infamy 1.0, how did that end? Uh Stefan wanted to do his own type of music. Okay. I believe yeah. more. Um. The, what the kicker really was though. We had a show, another show coming up at the Blackthorn, which was a much bigger show. I see. And uh, Brendan decided not to show up. Oh, man. Um, so I hold no ill will yeah. at this point in my life. Yeah. At that point, I did. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, he just did not show up to the show. It's like, hmm. No. I know he was in another band at the time. Uh, I'm not sure if, if there was some kind of conflict. Yeah. But um, I would have appreciated a warning. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So I could have been like, all right, you know what, let's cancel the show. Yeah. And we'll find another drummer. Yeah. But 
Unfortunately, that's not how that went down. Did you all end up playing that Blackthorn show? No. Oh, okay, okay. We were embarrassingly not there. I see, I see, I see. So that's how Divine Infamy 1.0 ended. I see, now, I see. Divine Infamy 2.0 formed, like I said, that I had a breakup at the time and I wanted to get my mind off of things. Yeah, sure. I contacted Brendan. We sat down, we spoke, and we uh, sort of like ironed everything out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's when 2.0 kicked in. Uh, Shauna, Manny, uh -huh. John, Genghis, Brendan, and myself. Um, and did you play in bands between, well, I guess Demise, obviously. Well, other Demise was before Divine yeah, Infamy. Yeah, right, Divine right. Infamy 2.0. Yeah. What other bands? Between, between that period? Yeah. I didn't think I did much. Yeah. I just did Demise before Divine Infamy. Yeah, yeah. I did a lot of stuff after 2.0. Yeah, sure. Between 2.0 and 3.0, I did a lot. I see, I see, I see, I see. It was actually four versions of Divine Infamy. Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, because I guess there's a, is there a version right now, even, maybe... I guess technically there is a 5.0. <laughs> in theory. In theory. In well, theory. I mean, you Who got knows? Us, you got us reunited here. Yeah, I mean. That's right. That's right. Um, uh, so, uh, I know Genghis, of course, already mentioned both of your time in Demise. Vinny, do you want to say anything about your time in Demise? I don't know how long I enjoyed it. Yeah. I mean, for sure. I mean, uh, seeing a multi-instrumentalist like Geo is a little like, whoa, this is damn good. Yeah, no, that dude, that dude would be... Plays everything. It's everything. I know. Bass, drums. You'd be surprised if he plays violin. Blast. <laughs> yeah. I've never heard blast beats like that since suffocation. Yeah. When he was doing blast beats, and I was like, you play drums? <laughs> I know. You know, you see him play guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But then when you see him at Evidence House or uh, Music Unlimited, I'm like, oh, shit, you play drums? He was doing the blast beats. Yeah. That dude plays everything. Was great. He's the one-man really fan. Yep. But what we liked about Gio was he gave us the road experience. Yeah. Because we did play all over oh, the East yeah. Coast. Oh. We did. We played like a lot of places. Yeah. We played Albany. Albany with we played a lot Pyrexia. Of, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. We played a lot okay. of shows with Gio. Yeah. I know I know. Demise has been all around. So you all, you all toured played, with we Demise. We played a lot in like Brooklyn, Manhattan, Albany. Wow. And a lot of a lot of people in the Bronx have jammed with Demise because they, they yeah. were like one of the bigger bands. Yeah, for sure. Like they're really, really well known. For sure. It's like music school. Yeah, yeah one artist. of the, their vocalists, which he passed away, his name was uh, Juan Gori Reyes. Okay, okay. He passed away a while yeah. back. He used to sing for them. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of a lot of like uh, good musicians jammed with Demise. Wow. Wow. Because as, as Gio was the one-man band, when you walk into the studio and he shows you the stuff, he's showing it on guitar, oh, yeah. uh, on drums. Everything. I'm like, oh, the shit's already composed? <laughs> okay, I'm going to have to learn it. <laughs> That's right. So yeah, no, he's really good. Man. That's right. I wish him all the best. I, Absolutely. I was listening to the interview the other day. I, was, I think I was watching it this morning. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, big bro's still around. That's that's great. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he Lewis, is. I haven't seen in a long time. Lewis from Go to Mentis. Yeah. But he used to play bass for Demise. Ah, okay. So, okay. And yeah, Lewis yeah. and I used that's to where work. I met him. Yeah, Lewis and I used to work together at Sam March Place at this place called the Sock Man. Sock Man. So yeah, man. Lewis, Lewis was into like uh, Sepultura uh -huh, and, uh -huh. and Soulfly. Yeah, he was like the, the, the Latin American fucking yeah. devil. <laughs> That's right. That's the right. handsome devil with the hair all like nice yeah, and shit. Yeah, man. He looked like a, like, a, like a metal drug dealer. Yeah. <laughs> I love you, Louis, but he looks like he'll sell you like a Deicide album with like a pound of blow. Like here. <laughs> <laughs> I love that guy. That guy was funny, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, as far as Divine Infamy 2.0, what was the first um, show that you all had with Divine Infamy 2.0, if you remember? Was it... I think Johnny set it up for us. It was did. it Ace of Clubs? Oh, it was, no, Ace of Clubs was after. It was the Port... port some Port. Port 41. Port 41. Oh, yeah. 41. We played with Goddamn okay. Hate. Uh-huh. Um... I, I, think, I don't know if we went on before them or after them. I totally forget. That's what we played for the first time with them. Mm. Oh, I see. Which I is see. online, actually. Yeah. We played yeah. for 41. And then we did Ace of Clubs. Because Kevin, Kevin Castle was the one that, that, yes. that promoted those clubs. events. Okay. I see. And what are some of the other um, venues that you all would play with? Or um, play at? Ace of Clubs. We uh -huh. played. We played uh, Gleason's. Gleason's, which was on, on East Chester Road. Road. Okay. Oh, Gleason's, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I can't remember one. Well, yeah, but with Shauna, I know we played like like uh, two shows, at least two shows. Yeah, yeah. We, but then when she she got arrested, we did uh we tried to play shows uh with Brooklyn. other with other members in Brooklyn. We played a couple of shows. Yeah, 
I think we had Art from Goddamn Hate fill in, and then he joined the band. Yeah. That lasted a little bit. Yep. I remember Art telling me the first time uh, when he heard us, it was at that first show we had. And he was like, he was like, I was wondering who the hell this band was that had more people than Goddamn Hate that night. <laughs> He's like, that never happens. He was like, who the fuck are these people? Yeah, no, and Art, he heard us and he really liked it. Art's <laughs> such a funny dude. Like, he's in a black metal band now called Jodenheim. Uh, there you go, buddy. I'm promoting your stuff. Uh, yeah. Uh, he has the long black hair now. But when we met him, he looked like one of them dudes from, like, Jersey Shore. Oh, yeah. It was hilarious. The blowout. Yeah. The blowout. I was like, who the fuck is this guy? Oh, that's our bass player from Goddamn Hate. Yeah, oh, like, but he's, he was a cool dude. He was all right. <laughs> but yeah, no, I think he joined Divine for me because he's into black metal. Yeah, sure. Yeah. He's into like Immortal and stuff like that. Yeah. But I think I think he just wanted to take Shauna. Because ah, uh, yeah, I we see. were approached a lot of times. Uh, oh, who's that hot chick that's singing for you? So maybe they <laughs> that's wanted. That's art. Yeah, they wanted to like date her, but yeah, we weren't having that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was little sister right there. That's you right. Your ass kicked. That's right. Yeah. Um, and were there other? bands, particularly in the Bronx, but, you know, could be around New York City that uh, Divine Infamy 2.0 had a close relationship with? Goddamn Heat. Goddamn Okay, me. yeah. I, I Goddamn figured. Heat, for sure. Yeah. We yeah. were very, very much. Very close with them. We even shared a room with them. Yeah, we did? At oh. the Music Unlimited, oh. after Rich lost it, they reopened it again and called yes. it the Music Underground? Yes. Yes, yes. The Music Underground. And the same room that, that we had with Demise, Room C, yeah. became our room. It was Goddamn Hate and um, Divine Infamy. We shared that room briefly. But then Music Underground closed down, too. They were having problems with the yeah. circuitry. Yeah. Yeah, the power wow. was always out. Wow. That place is cursed, man. Yeah, I know. That That's place is cursed. Like. So many problems in that place. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Wow. So when that place closed, is that when you all went to the Sobro... Rehearsal. No, Sobro was when, was when we were first early, uh, trying out. I see, I see. Because I see. when Shauna joined the band, to make it easy on her, we went to Astoria Soundworks. That makes sense. Yeah, because that she was a trip. Queens. That was a trip. Yes. But it was cool because Astoria Soundworks had much, a lot of new equipment, very, very uh, good sounding equipment. Sure. And uh, we tried out all the stuff that we later on recorded in three songs. Ah, Manny, see. Manny, Manny's bass playing. I mean, he plays guitar too. Oh, yeah. But his bass playing, like, you hear that, boom, what a little shit. I know. Like, <laughs> wow. And he looks like somebody that could fuck you up. That's so it's like having an MMA fighter in your fucking bag. I used to, when high school, I used to call him Young Danzig. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I wow. thought I was an intimidating one. I was like, oh, I'm a bouncer. I'll sit for four. Yeah. He joined the band. I was like, nah. And he nah. still looks young. He does. Yeah. He does. What is it with you guys? What is it in the tap water that you guys drink? <laughs> this guy know. still looks like he's 25. Yeah. I, I saw um, Manny's interview the other day. Now he looks young. He looks very young. He does look very young. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. How old is Manny? He's got to be like your age, right? Close, right? Maybe you're young. I'm 44. Yeah. I was yeah. 28 when I started jamming with this guy. Wow. So, yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, so, why don't you all talk a little bit about the... You know, what happened between Divine Infamy 2.0 and, and the reunion of Divine Infamy? Yeah. As you mentioned, there are various bands. Um, so Divine Infamy 3, uh, 2.0 to 3.0. So after the whole experience, after the whole thing with uh, her being arrested and incarcerated, um, I... Andrew reached out to Andrew. He, he, was, was, a, he was a fan. He was we, a fan uh, of ours. We didn't want to, like, wait forever. Like, we thought she was going to get out. Yeah. yeah. But then we seen it was gonna go on and on yeah, and on. Yeah, I was yeah. like, I was like, this sucks. I was like, but you know, there are other people we have sure. to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. um, so I we put it to the to the vote, and it was voted unanimously to find somebody else and move on. Uh -huh. yeah. So that's when we found Andrew, an excellent excellent vocalist, excellent vocalist. much different style, but a very excellent vocalist. And he learned all, all her lyrics and wrote lyrics of his own. Oh. So wow. we had two versions of the songs, wow. what she wrote and what he wrote. Yeah, we kept it true to what she had originally from mm -hmm. those songs that existed. And he was very cool with it. He listened to it. He figured out the lyrics. Uh-huh. Kept it as is. Didn't take credit for it. Nothing. Yeah. And the other stuff he wrote his own lyrics for. I see. Um, that was going well until, uh, you know, for whatever reason, uh, Brendan decided he didn't want to do it again. Oh, I see. And that's what ended Divine Infamy 3.0. I see. And because at that point, once Brendan said he wasn't interested, Andrew said he wasn't interested mm -hmm. anymore, and Arthur said he wasn't interested anymore. Because we weren't going to find a better drummer. Than we, weren't gonna find, we weren't going to find a better drummer anytime soon. 
mm-hmm. yeah. at all. Yeah. Um, so I was like, all right. Then Divine Infamy 3.0 then came to an end for uh-huh. quite a few years. Uh, at that point, I decided to start my own band called mm-hmm. the Nominati, uh-huh. which was much more traditional black metal. I see. With more of my newer influences, I learned, you know, I learned to play guitar better. I got into more types of music. Yeah. So Divine Infamy became the Nominati. I found this fellow named Guy uh, online. Uh, tried him out. I liked it. Uh, a bass player. Um, thought he was a good bass player. I was like, cool. We never had a singer. We can never find a damn singer. Every singer that Hard, came in, yeah. that came in that band came and went. We didn't like anyone. We're like, ah, no, 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 no. Yeah. Eventually, we did settle on someone. This guy from Queens. He was very good. Uh, everything was going well. We recorded a three-song demo. No vocals, of course, at the time. Yeah. The music of, of Innominati was interesting. It was definitely black metal, but it had a lot of elements of progressive. Okay. Because the bass player was very much into progressive. I see. They considered a band at the time was Dream Theater. Ah, okay, um, okay. Definitely like blues, and you probably definitely like jazz, because if, if, I, if I listen to some of the parts, I can hear the influence of jazz sure. in his playing. Sure. Um, you know, Manati had a song, a rather long song, in which the middle section was uh, all improv. Which is more jazz. Wow. So it was like this very funky bass thing going. A lot of blues guitar soloing with some jazz in it. Interesting. Interesting. Wow. In a black metal song. Because mm-hmm. it was very heavy, the other parts. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. And it worked out very well. Um, the band went pretty long and it was good. I liked it. But then, you know, things happened in that band. Uh, I was approached by some two of the members. They had a problem with another one of the members playing at the time. They had threatened to leave at the time if I didn't do something. Yeah. So, uh, foolishly, I should have gotten rid of them. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. they were the problem. Yeah. And kept the other. I'm not mentioning names on purpose. Yeah, sure, sure, um, sure. I should have not listened to them. I should not have caved in. And that was in Mount Vernon. These guys were yeah, we were practicing Mount Vernon, Mount Vernon. Ah, and that's uh, when they met um, Eden, a- a- the, the Eden drummer AD. from Eden AD. Okay, okay. And that's when we were like, because uh, I used to go to the band practices yeah. for Illuminati. I think I tried out. Right. And then Vinny was like, you know what? Let's do a reunion show. Yeah. And I think Andrew. That's where four point oh came. Yeah, uh-huh. Andrew had moved to Texas. Yeah. But he was in town for like a weekend or two. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, so, so we did a performance. We did a performance at the Black Room. And Scott, that was in Queens. Scott so. from Eden AD. He learned the songs. Because everybody liked the songs, but they were catchy. Yeah. But, you know, as I said yeah. before, it wasn't, it wasn't the same, but yeah. I'm glad people enjoyed it. And then after that, we were trying to keep the band together. It was me, it was Scott, it was this guy named John on guitar, Mara on keyboards, um, uh, the same vocalist from Anominati, same bass player from Anominati, yeah. and myself. But eventually, heads butted very, very much in that band. And I was like, you know what? I was like, I'm going to copyright the music. Uh-huh. On the EP, uh-huh. and I'm calling it quits. Yes. Yeah. I was like, that's it. Yeah. So I have the copyrights. I had Axe Gang's permission and John permission because of the uh, music. Yeah, sure. Um, I had always said that, you know, if Brennan ever wanted to use his music, it's his music, he could do whatever the hell he wants to do with it. So I didn't, you know, and this is not going to say nothing. I didn't, the lyrics are all Sean as I didn't do nothing with those, but. But he had come up with a name. Unfortunately, too. somebody did, did keep asking me to use the music in their own project. I was like, no, 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 yeah, no. Sure. So I, I felt like I had copyrighted to, sure. to, to protect it. Absolutely. And that's the only reason why I did it. It wasn't despite any of the prior members of Divine, of Divine Infamy. Sure. Sure. The Divine Infamy hasn't been mentioned, so you gave us the opportunity to interview us today. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So thank you. We got to uh, tell our side of the story. And as you can see, there's only two left. <laughs> that, that's like right. Conan. At least All that now. matters is that two stood against me. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and after 4.0, I was in like a bunch of bands yeah. trying out. I was working with these guys named Imperial Crypt. Okay. White Plains black metal band. Extremely good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I worked with them. And I gave excuses why I couldn't be with them. I, I hated music for a long time. I see. Yeah, I despised yeah. music. Yeah. And I despised many of the people who I played with. Sure. Um, not the old school people. Yeah. You know, but the people who I actually played with were divine into me. I didn't like a lot of people. Sure. And that's why I decided to say the hell with I'm moving out of the Bronx. Yeah. Which was a mistake because it was uh, all anger. Yeah. I didn't think clearly. And now I'm like, oh, I want to move back. I regret it. Yeah, sure. So 
No, but you, you needed that to clear your head. I did. Because that's yeah. the dividing for me. I hated music as well, too. I didn't even pick up my guitar for a long time. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then when Vinny and I started getting in touch again, I was like, maybe I should start playing. Then I, uh, for two years, yeah. I've had nerve damage on my arm. Mm. So it's mm -hmm. like... I guess it is what it is. Yeah, it is. So hopefully, is. you know, um, yeah. the doctors can tell me something on the 22nd. I'm going to get an MRI. And if there's hope for me to play guitar again. Hope so. You know, Vinny, he has my oh, number. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. I'll come back. <laughs> I've always said I wouldn't play music again, really, unless it's someone from back in the day. Yeah. Like, yeah. way back in the day. Like, 90s era. Well, obviously, it's an exception to Genghis. But yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um so is there anything else that um i have a final question that i'll ask in in a second but first is there anything else that either of you would like to share about divine infamy or any other you know parts of the history that you've covered today that we haven't talked about yet well i mean uh, our previous members like whatever path they chose in life we wish them well yeah no animosity no hatred you know as i said before breaking up with a band is harder than breaking up with like a wife or a girlfriend because yeah. you share so much time together mm -hmm. And, you know, hopefully one day if we start music again, we'll all be reunited. Because, you know, when you, you put this documentary out there, I know people are going to be interested in the Bronx metal scene. And who knows, maybe sometimes at, at the end of the year or next year, we'll play a show for everybody, a reunion show. I mean, we're all in our 40s. Yeah. We, could get it, you know, we could get it together for one day and be like, let's play for the new generation. I hope sure. so. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So, guys... Let's make it happen. Absolutely. And Vinny, what about you before um, the final question? There are things on the horizon. Yeah. Um, I am definitely working with a group of people at, at this moment. I'm not going to mention names yet. Sure. I'm still in the evaluation phase. Yeah. Um, but they are an older band from the 90s. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and uh, besides that, there's another project I'm working on with uh, someone else from the 90s. From specifically 89 to 93, I met him. So you, can, you can narrow that down now. Yes. So, uh, yes. share birthday. Uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> a UFC fighter that we mentioned. UFC, UFC fighter. UFC fighter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so the final question I have for the two of you being a part of, uh, you know, this pivotal black metal band, um, you know, at least centered in the Bronx, even though there are, you know, members from the wider New York City, of course, involved too. Um, Looking back, would you say, is there anything that was like distinctively Bronx about um, the sound of Divine Infamy? And if so, like, what do you think that was? Yes, there is a Bronx sound. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've heard it mentioned. Groove. Groove. You mentioned that earlier, even. Yes. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. was a distinct sound to Divine Infamy, despite it having heavy black metal influences and whatnot. There was groove to it. A lot of mm -hmm. what they call breakdowns, which are actually uh, bridges. Yeah, you know? sure. Which is now what the kids like, that metalcore stuff. Absolutely. Because back they in the day, people stuff. loved metal, but they, they all come from L.A. Yeah. We didn't really have any bands coming out of New York. Yeah. So until the Bronx started getting bands, then they're like, oh, shit, there's a movement in, in New York. We got to yeah. go fuck with that. Yeah. yeah and yeah, then yeah, as yeah. you see, the early 2000s, the new metal started. Disturbed is from Chicago. Uh -huh. uh, Mud Rain was from Illinois. Yeah. So New York and L.A., we really made the rest of the country yeah. wake up. Like yes. you got to get a, get on this. Definitely, that's, I think that's the uh, uniting factor, sound wise. Yeah, yeah. Um, even if you listen to some of the songs of Brendan, you can hear a distinct hip hop element in his drumming. It's from the Bronx. It's like uh -huh. you hear the danciness in it. And I'm like, it's so weird. It's black metal. It's dancey. <laughs> yeah. Um, as far as like the sound, that's the uh, thing. And as far as like Bronx music in general. Loyalty. Loyalty, okay. Is the uh, like driving that. socio, not economic, but social. Yeah, aspect. sure, sure. Everybody, it was accepting of everybody. I was going out to hardcore shows dressed like this. Nobody bothered me. No one gave a shit. They're like, yeah. oh shit, you're into a, you're like, you're like, like black metal. I'm like, oh yeah. And they're like, oh shit, you got to hear that. Like, oh shit, it's really good. Yeah. So we were all very accepting of each other's differences. Yeah. Gio that's, had mentioned that in the interview. That's right. That you got the long hairs on one side and the hard kids on one side. Yeah. That went on in Brooklyn and everywhere else. Yeah, sure. But once you go to a broad show, we're all fighting together as brothers. That's yeah. right. But yeah, um, when I used to go to the Lamorts Club, it was a lot of that. The skinheads come in and the long hairs. Now you can't have a good time because nobody likes the hardcore kid. All the goth kid came in. Uh -huh. And that's how a lot of fights happen. As I said uh -huh. before, you take a look at my knuckles, a lot of fights happen. 
That's right. Especially when Hatebreed came around. People throwing oh. trash cans at people. And I know Hatebreed even played at, at Blackthorn once. Oh, they played uh, everywhere. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it was Hatebreed and um, Candiria that played mm -hmm. at Candiria. the Blackthorn. You're from Connecticut. Your new hometown. <laughs> <That's Ooh. right. laughs> not for long. Yeah, now get out of there, man. 